Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Seth Harp. He is an investigative journalist and a rock war veteran who is a contributing editor for Rolling Stone magazine. Recently was in Ukraine for a report that will come out soon in Harper's magazine. Seth Harp, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me. I first want to get your reaction to something that was just passed in Congress, something like 40 billion more dollars for the proxy war in Ukraine. Most of that will be spent on military assistance. 57 members of Congress voted against it. All of them were Republicans, zero Democrats voted to oppose this bill. Now, your thoughts on this measure and how it will impact the war in Ukraine right now? I mean, I should say that some part of me is glad that the Ukrainians are getting weapons so that they can uh, resist the Russian invaders in their country. Um, on the other hand, it's also depressing to see, you know, just at a time when it seemed like U.S. militarism might be on the wane after the final defeat in Afghanistan, that we might um, see some reinvestment of all that money that's for the past uh, several decades gone, you know, been plowed into the military industrial complex, be you know, redistributed to where it's sorely needed in this country. But, you know, you see that they, well, Congress can't pass things like a minimum wage and they can't, um, you know, provide benefits to people that are, that are desperately in need for it. It's just, you know, they're able with lightning speed to, to um, you know, approve a grant of $40 billion um, to, to Ukraine for, for weapons. It's pretty amazing, but, you know, not, not all that surprising. And when you say that you're happy that Ukrainians are getting weapons to resist Russia's invasion, from what you could tell on the ground, I mean, how have U.S. weapons impacted the war so far? It's really difficult to say because there's such limited access to like front lines and places where fighting is actually taking place. Like it's kind of this, um, this is like zone of almost mystery where, where, you know, concentrated around the areas of active fighting, like what exactly is taking place there? You don't see footage, you don't see combat footage, you don't see footage of battles like you would see in past wars. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to assess just how effective the, you know, the weapons have been, but certainly in the, during the battle of Kiev, I was in Kiev during, um, during the battle that was on the outskirts of the city. Um, and for sure, you know, javelins and, and um, in-laws played a huge role in that. And also, uh, Bayraktar drones as well. I think those were really decisive in allowing the Ukrainians to turn back, uh, you know, the Russian expeditionary force. And do you think that Russia was making a real attempt to capture Kiev. There are people like Scott Ritter who argue that that was just a feint. That was a way to divert Ukrainian forces away from the Donbass, which is what Russia really cares about. I mean, I really doubt it. Um, Who knows? You can't really get in the heads of the Russian leadership. But, you know, I was at the scene of battles where there was dead Russian soldiers lying on the ground. It really brought home, you know, the the losses that Russia incurred there, you know, losing a dozen tanks at, at one time. It would seem like an awfully um, callous, brutal, calculated. I think it's beyond the capacity of the Russians to make a to make a move that far in advance and lose on purpose like that. I think that they tried. The, I think they tried. The, I think they thought the Ukrainian leadership was shakier than it was, um, and I think that they just got repelled. So, talk to us about what it's like to be a journalist reporting inside Ukraine, trying to cover the war. How did you get in, and, and where did you go? Uh, it's pretty. It's easy to get into Ukraine with at least with an American passport. You can just go right across the border. Um, so I went to Lviv and then Kiev and areas like suburbs around Kiev. Well, as I mentioned, it was uh, you know it was uh, it was uh, the battle to defend the city was the major military event that was going on when I was there, um, as well as the battle for Mariupol. But it's impossible to approach there. Um, so it was it was relatively easy to get into the country, but you know getting access to the military, getting access to the front lines is. I found it to be practically impossible. Um, and, you know, looking around at other reports that have come out from Ukraine, you know, that you don't see interviews with commanders, you don't see footage from field hospitals, you don't see like accurate body counts. So um, it was a really, I would say, I don't want to say repressive reporting environment, but, um, you know, certainly a forbidding reporting environment. So, yeah. In terms of the access the journalists can get to the Ukrainian military, going to the hospitals where Ukrainians are being treated. How does that compare to prior wars that you've covered and, and prior wars that you've been in, you served in Iraq? Yeah, very different. You know, as I was mentioning before, like you can't really go in field hospitals and see wounded soldiers. Um, you can't, you know, talk to unit commanders. Um, you can't observe 
you know, even like, you know, let's say a second line unit, like an artillery unit, for example, you can't even get that far. Um, and so I think that was a big difference between past wars that I've covered in Ukraine. And do you have any insight into what really happened in some of the most controversial atrocities of the war in Bucha, where Russia was accused of committing war crimes, same as in Mariupol? Do you have any sources who have told you any information that can help you determine what actually happened? Because in the fog of war, it's very difficult to, you know, to, to trust any side. Yeah, I mean, I think the war crime, the major war crime that people should be concerned about um, and alarmed about and angry about is the invasion itself. Um, even though Russia, I think, or even though the United States and NATO for, for years and decades have pushed farther and farther up to the borders of Russia and have militarized the former Soviet countries around Russia and have engaged in every form of provocation that you can imagine, desperately wanted this war to happen. Um, Russia is not justified in, in, in responding to that by invading a sovereign country. Um, that's just a clear black and white line in, in my view. So that's the, the war crime that I think people should be concerned about. I think that the atrocities in, in Bucho, Bucho are horrifying, um, you know, are, don't quite have the significance that, that, uh, that, has, been, that has been overlaid on them. Um, it, to me, it just seems like a garden variety sort of atrocity that invading armies will commit. Um, they'll kill large numbers of civilians. They'll retaliate against, you know, resistance forces. I don't know what happened in Bucha. I'm not sure that in Bucha, I'm not sure that anybody does. Uh, clearly something very bad happened there. Um, you know, some of the more uh, conspiratorial views about it where it's, you know, I think um, uh, speculated that you know, maybe that somehow the Ukrainians staged it or possibly even I've heard some people speculate, you know, on the base, basis of the Azov battalion's presence there at that time that it could have been the Azov that killed those people. My sense of that is very, very doubtful. Like, I just don't think the Ukrainians killed other Ukrainians in that situation. Um, that said, you know, the site the, 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 where it took place was secured by the Ministry of Defense for like uh, 48 hours before any journalists were allowed there. Um, and when they were allowed there, it was very much, you know, like guided tours, like journalists went in police vans under police escort and were given a tour of all the dead bodies that were lying in the street. Um, and were closely, you know, monitored basically uh, the entire time. So because of the way the Ukrainians control that environment, I think probably questions will always linger about, you know, what exactly happened there. Um, but no, no sources have told me like it, that it was something other than, you know, basically what, what the Ministry of Defense said happened there. Um, my sense, and this is just a pure guess, um, you know, a lot of Ukrainians have joined the territorial defense, which is like the reserve militia, um, and separate from the, from the active duty army that was just doing most of the fighting. But a lot of Ukrainian men in military age, I think there's like something like 900,000 people in the, in the territorial defense force. And it's very loosely organized. And, and a lot of people have just joined and they just have got like their paperwork or whatever. They're on the point of having a weapon to shoot to them. Um, so there's a lot of people who are basically enlistees uh, uh, knocking around the country in one way or another. And my guess is that a lot of the men who were killed in Buka, you know, the, the Russians may have suspected them of having recently joined the military or been, you know, maybe they uh, had already been in the military and may have had like military tattoos or something of that nature. You know, just looking for some way to explain why they would execute all those civilians. Um, because in other places that I went that had been liberated, like in Boyarka and Zabuchichia, um, you know, I would have loved nothing more than to expose Russian war crimes. Um, I have absolutely no love at all for, for, the, for the Russians uh, invading army. Um, but the people, you know, didn't say that that's what happened. You know, they said they camped out in the forest. They would sometimes come into town. They would do patrols. Uh, and some, in one case, they burned down the houses of policemen. But, you know, the people, the Ukrainian people that I interviewed who had been under occupation, by and large, told me that the Russians just left them alone. Um, so that's why I think that uh, Bucha is an isolated event, you know, the circumstances behind which uh, remain pretty unclear exactly what happened, but certainly, you know, the Russians were responsible for that. Well, that's why I think all these claims just need skepticism. And um, it's very easy to speculate, especially for someone like me who's not, who, who has not been there. But 
especially because of that experience you just relayed, which I have not heard too many Western journalists say that actually Ukrainian residents report being treated relatively well by Russians. I mean, that's why when you have allegations like Bucha and, and also in Mariupol that are then used to advocate for more militarism, more intervention by the U.S. than is already being done, I just think they're worthy of skepticism. It doesn't mean I don't believe them. I just think they're worthy of um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my guess is that, or my sense is that it's it's more or less like in Iraq. Um, you know, I was a soldier in the U.S. Army in Iraq. You know, certainly the guys in my unit, I never, well, I mean, it's a mixed bag. You know, soldiers do bad things, but then other soldiers are trying to do the right thing. Um, and generally, they're under orders to not uh, kill civilians arbitrarily, to not steal things, to not obviously not rape women. Those are standing orders that soldiers of, from whatever country are generally subjected to. But you have isolated atrocities that take place in places, um, you know, in, in, in Iraq, for example, the, the crimes that we saw in Abu Ghraib or in other places um, versus other towns that may have been occupied where the American soldiers there really did try to treat the people well. So again, you know, the point that I was making earlier, the crime is the invasion, just like in Iraq, you know, the, the crime is setting that in, in motion to where you're not going to be able to control, you know, your, your military. And sometimes they are going to commit abuses. And that's why we don't invade sovereign countries. Well, let me ask you this. And, and I've asked sort of the inverse question to people who said that Russia had no choice but to invade, given the mm -hmm. position they were in. What mm -hmm. do you think Russia should have done to have avoided the invasion? Because as you said, you recognize that they were sort of pushed into a corner with NATO expansion, with the proxy war in Ukraine that began eight years ago. So how do you think Russia could have uh, peacefully resolved its concerns? And I'm not saying this to be combative because I actually mm -hmm. agree with you. I, I can't accept that Russia had no choice but to invade a mm -hmm. country. But I'm just curious your thoughts on what you think Russia should have done. I don't know. They're, you know, they're up against it. They're hard, they've been hard pressed by the United States. The U.S. made a choice going back to the Clinton administration that rather than integrate uh, Russia into the sort of Western order, um, that they were going to punish them. And they were, they were going to keep them in their corner and keep them down, basically. Um, and that's been going on for, for many years. And I don't really know how to respond to your question. It'd be a question for, for diplomats. Um, but I, I wouldn't agree that they were left with no choice but but to invade. I'm I'm anti-war, um, and you know it's a principled thing. And if, if whether it's the United States or whether it's Russia, like there's always another choice but to start bombing cities and start sending tanks across the border and start shooting people. Like that's always to be avoided unless you have some kind of international framework of legitimacy. Um, you know, under the, whether it's the UN Security Council or whatever. So. I'm not exactly sure what uh, Russia should have done differently, um, except not invade Ukraine. So you were in Ukraine to cover a specific aspect of the war, which is the international volunteers that have come around the world to fight against Russia on mm -hmm. the side of the Ukrainians. What can you tell us about that experience? Uh, yeah, that was the particular assignment that I was sent over to, to cover. Um, the, you know, the internet, I previously covered the international volunteers in Syria with the YPG. Um, and I expected it to be more or less like that, um, except that it seemed like the number of volunteers was much, much larger going over to Ukraine. I mean, it happened so fast, like within two days, I think, of the, of the invasion, President Zelensky announced the formation of this unit. And then like within a week, they claimed they had um, enlisted 20,000 people from 52 different countries. So I went over there expecting more or less to find um, some kind of appreciable or cognizable foreigners battalion, but um, mostly what I found was confused uh, volunteers who had come over from mostly from the United States and Great Britain who uh, were not able to find a, any real unit to join. Um, and long story short, you know, it was, I think it was mostly propaganda, like a propagandistic move to create this unit. Um, there really isn't a, a, a single unitary freestanding unit that could be called the International Legion. Most of the people that went over there and tried to join failed. Um, they're not actually bringing people over. Um, and at least during the Battle of Kiev, you know, there were, there were virtually no Westerners in, in, in combat. Um, you know, what's more, they really don't need um, volunteers. They have a lot of people in reserve already. Ukraine has the largest army in Europe. Um, and they have that territorial defense militia that I was talking about before. So they have a, a major surplus of untrained manpower 
and even guys who have previously uh, served in Iraq, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, but are combat veterans, even they're not all that useful because they most for the most part they don't speak Ukrainian, they don't speak Russian. It's difficult to integrate those people uh, into the unit. So I found that it was more myth than reality. So what you're saying is that you didn't see Malcolm Nance, who is the uh, <laughs> analyst for MSNBC, big promoter of Russia Gate. He's gone over to volunteer to fight for uh, Ukraine. He says he's done talking, but all he's done, it seems like, is talk, keep talking to U.S. media, though this time yeah. not as an MSC analyst, not as an MSNBC analyst, but just dressed in fatigues yeah. and claiming to be fighting. Yeah. Uh, no, he called me um, to like yell at me for an hour. He's in much of like special, a uh, soft lingo. Um, because I had said on another podcast that the foreign region was a myth and he, he was trying to convince me that in fact it was real. He claimed that uh, there was a training base that he had been to where they had an entire battalion. So, you know, that's like 800 to 1,000 soldiers. He said that they were divided into four companies. He said that they had a commander. None of that stuff I was able to bear out. I think it was mostly, um, you know, wishful thinking on his part. But, you know, look, I think Malcolm Nance is basically harmless. If he wants to, you know, he's in Lviv, for example. I mean, that's an important point. To, as far as I know, he's in Lviv, which is hundreds of miles from any, any actual fight. So him toting around an AK, um, you know, at his age is, it, it's kind of like, it's a little bit funny, but I think mostly, mostly harmless. He, he, he's not in combat and I don't think there's any danger of him being in combat anytime soon. But look, the Ukrainians like him. Um, they're happy to have him out there as a spokesman for their cause. Um, but yeah, it, it is kind of goofy for him to like bust out and then listen to see on like full battle gear. <laughs> and what are your thoughts on the concerns that this war, this call for international volunteers has been attracting right-wing extremists from around the world, drawn by the groups like the Azov Battalion, the Nazi yeah. paramilitary force incorporated into the Ukrainian army. And that they're getting heavy weaponry that will that will stay in their hands after this war ends, and yeah. now that those weapons that the U.S. is flooding Ukraine with will then be spread throughout Europe and sold on the black market and and you know used for for violence. It's a it's a real concern anytime you're flooding a country with weapons like that. You know, you mentioned the forty billion dollar um, you know defense uh, appropriation that was just made. The reason it's so easy for Congress to do that and what it's and why it's so hard for them to um, come up with any funding for like single mothers uh, or like schools or, or, or what have you or student debt relief is because that type of money actually goes to people who need it. Um, whereas money that's appropriated for Ukraine, you know, it's not dumped in a big pile of cash in Ukraine. It, it gets filtered through, uh, you know, the U.S. defense industry, what the weapons industry. So the money is basically, for the most part, is going to is going to uh, U.S. defense contractors, and that's very easy for Congress to do because that's their true constituency. Those are the people that they actually serve, um, and. The result of that is uh, is that the weapons, you know, have to. It's all kind of pro forma, and because the ultimate point of it is to is to enrich um, is to enrich industry in the United States. But then you end up with the outflow of weapons that actually do go to countries which we've seen so many times in the past, especially in Syria, uh, also in, in Libya. Um, but I don't think we've ever seen anything on the scale of Ukraine. The amount of um, you know relatively sophisticated weapons that are going over there. So anytime you're flooding a country like that, I think it's definitely a cause for concern. Like what's, especially because Ukraine is the most corrupt country in Europe, um, as measured by the Transparency International Index, which is which is like basically um, sort of U.S. backed and funded. Usually, it denigrates the enemies of the United States, but even on that list, Ukraine it shows as, as the most corrupt country in Europe. So there's there's no telling where exactly those weapons are going are going to end up. Um, as far as attracting right wing volunteers, you know. For years, there have been international volunteers in the Donbass region, as I'm sure you know. And, uh, you know, I, I have some sources in there who have told me over the years that there are a fair amount of, like, neo-Nazi skinhead types among that, like, first generation of volunteers. The groups that are coming over now, I was not able to detect that um, as part of, like, their motivation. It's, it's kind of a curious thing because it's almost like a, a, it's almost like a jihad for, you know, for, like, centrist uh, people or so, or people who are either liberal or just garden variety conservative, um, or have totally generic political opinions. You know, I would ask people, "Why are you coming over here?" And they would say, "Well, I believe in America and I believe in freedom." I mean, that was like the extent of their political philosophy. Um, 
So I didn't see like a large contingent. And also the Ukrainians are well aware of this like reputation that they have. And they're well aware of the, of how key uh, Western support is for their cause. And so they're keen to turn away anybody who may seem to fit that profile. Like I interviewed the commander of the Georgian national legion. And he, I didn't even say anything about it. He just brought it up himself. He was like, I absolutely don't take any, any of those like neo-Nazi racist, whatever type people. Um, we just, it's totally unacceptable. We just kicked them out. You know, he's saying this before I even brought the subject up. So, uh, I think that those people should go over there. They might have trouble joining any units, but that being said, um, it's quite possible that there are a small number who are doing that Azov battalion. Um, so I interviewed the, the commander of Azov, uh, a- Andrew Biletsky, a founder, excuse me. And, uh, one of his top commanders, a guy named Maxime, uh, his last name is you right now. Um, but I spent as much time as possible as I could at their base in Kiev because I was really interested to see, you know, what this unit is about. Um, and certainly, you know, their, their ideology is a matter of, a matter of record. You know, it, it is, they, they are absolutely a sort of neo-pagan sort of quasi-fascist, hardcore right-wing um, organization. You know, I even asked the Maxine guy, um, do you believe in democracy or do you think like, um, the will of the people is expressed through like the emergence of a strong leader, kind of like that Nietzschean um, fascist ideal. And he said, you know, definitely I would prefer a strong leader to emerge from the Volk uh, and, and, you know, be you sort of crown the, 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 the leader of Ukraine. But the irony is that here we are fighting for democracy in, in Europe. So he, they would say things like that and, you know, not really trying to conceal who they are, but also highlighting like their role, which is absolutely central in the, in the war right now. I mean, the biggest battle uh, in Ukraine when I was there was in Mariupol and um, the Azov battalion was the main force that was there. And it was just incredible how that was erased from all the reporting that was done on Mariupol. You never heard, they, they, they referred to Denis uh, Proponivik, I can't even say his last name, Dennis P., the commander of the Az- original Azov uh, regiment, um, who was commanding the force in Mariupol. I mean, you would see his name mentioned in the New York Times and the Washington Post almost on a daily basis, and they would just call him a Ukrainian commander. Um, but even though he is the uh, main military commander of the Azov battalion. So um, lost my train of thought, forgot what the question was there. But oh, about people joining Azov. So Azov is primarily made up of Eastern European people, uh, primarily Ukrainians, uh, some Russians, um, people from the people from like Azerbaijan, people from Slovakia, Moldova, whatever. Um, but they do have some international volunteers who are very, very elusive and hard to, to find. But they do have some. Actually, when I was leaving the base one day, I saw a group of them like hanging out outside the gate. They were just like some of the more of these volunteers that were um, looking for any unit that would have them. And they were hanging out outside of the, the Azov base. Uh, I presume to, to join up, they were looking to join up. And it was really noticeable because on the, because on the wall behind them at the spot outside the gates where they were waiting, it just said uh, white power in big block letters, just like spray painted on the wall behind them. So there is some element of this going on, but I think the number of these people is very, very small. The number may be small, but their importance to the Ukrainian military does seem to me to be pretty high, as evidenced um, by the fact that they're some of their best fighters. Oh, yeah, and yeah. That they're you know responsible for defending entire cities like Mariupol. Oh, yeah, I don't think this. Sorry, I don't think this number of Azov fighters is all that small. Um, they have several thousand. Uh, and like, as you said, they are the most squared away, uh, well-equipped, you know, disciplined um, motivated fighters that Ukraine has. I meant the number of foreign volunteers in Azov is like vanishing oh, small. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's not worth it for them, man. They 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 understand like the heat that they're going to get in the Western press if they're if they're hosting like you know white supremacists from the United States. It's going to be a problem for them. They're they're attuned to that media dynamic, um, and I just don't see like large scale like like right wing Americans joining Azov. But there may be a few. There may be a few like less than six. I would I would guess. We've seen uh, the head of NATO and other Western officials brag about how much assistance uh, uh, NATO has given to the Ukrainian military. Now you have anonymous U.S. officials bragging about how U.S. intelligence is helping to kill Russian generals. Something I don't really buy, but regardless, there's no doubt that Ukraine has been trained very and armed heavily by the U.S. and NATO. And I'm wondering 
from what you can gather, how that training and military support, over, not just in these few months of the war, but over the last eight years of, uh, of the war, how that's made a difference to the Ukrainian military on the ground? Another question that's very difficult to answer because of the lack of access to the Ukrainian military. Um, I think that certainly all of our general corps, all the colonels and so forth, have had some level of training with the United States. It can only have improved uh, their, their capabilities, I think. Um, but to some extent, the capabilities of the Ukrainian military remain to be seen. The defense of Kyiv was an amazing underdog victory. Um, however, defending cities is a lot easier than like offensive maneuvers. Um, and so now it was kind of amazing how quickly the, the conflict sort of reverted almost to um, where it has been since 2014 or 15, with the Russians falling back to the Donbass, also having taken some cities in the south. Um, so the big question for me is now whether the Ukrainians who, who say that they're going to mount a counteroffensive and retake those areas, one, whether they're actually going to attempt to do that, and two, whether, whether they can prevail. And I think that will be really the test of their, of their capacity and the training and equipment that they've received from the United States. And relatively early on in the war, you caused a bit of a stir online when you tweeted that U.S. special operators are on the ground in Ukraine doing what you called operational prep of the battlefield. And you named a unit of JSOC's advanced force operations. You then deleted this tweet, if I yeah. understand this right, because it, it, yeah. it caused, I think, a, 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 uh, an interpretation that you did not intend. So what did you yeah. mean by that? And, and, and what was going on there? Yeah, I couldn't take the heat. I was shook. People were accusing me, one, of like putting U.S. personnel in danger of being, you know, struck by like a, a Russian drone or people were accusing me of escalating nuclear tensions. It wasn't worth it. And, yeah, I did think people took it out of context because I don't think people realize the extent to which JSOC operates with impunity in whatever country they want. Um, they're in a lot of places where the U.S. has no official military presence. And to me, having reported on JSOC for years, it's kind of routine. It's not surprising. I would have been surprised if they weren't there. Um, you know, the key, uh, I think, phrase in that tweet is, according to an informed source, I called a, um, a, a JSOC colonel, uh, retired, who's no longer uh, active duty, but is retired uh, and played a key role in JSOC over the years. Um, and it, it's someone who has been a source of mine for years. And I, I uh, was mostly calling him for like a safety briefing because I was right about to cross over in Ukraine. And um, I don't know why he told me this uh, so freely, but he told me that, that absolutely that there was a JSOC unit that was currently on the ground in Ukraine. And he, he was keen to talk about it because it was that group that you mentioned, the AFO, the Advanced Force Operation. And this particular officer um, who was a Delta Force officer um, what played an instrumental role in creating the AFOs back in the day, post 2001. And he was, uh, he was, uh, enthusiastic to talk about, you know, how this is a perfect opportunity for the AFOs to go into action because they basically will go into countries, uh, before the United States invades or before there's a military action or where there just might be a military action at the risk of it and do what you mentioned, operational prep of, of the battlefield, um, which is essentially marking, you know, like airstrips, marking landmarks, either for like landing zones or to be struck by airstrikes. Um, they're not there in an offensive capacity. If it's true what this guy said, if that they were there, or that they are there, they're not there like to, to start, you know, to start uh, like murking Russian commanders or whatever. I didn't mean it to, to suggest that it was like a U.S. escalation. This is just par for the course. Um, so that was the, yeah, that was the background of that tweet. And I'll add something else to that. Um, I was able to interview some Ukrainian commanders. Boletsky was one, although he's, you know, he's, he is part of the Ukrainian military now. Azov Battalion is part of the Ukrainian military officially. It's not just a militia. Also, same story with the Georgian Foreign Legion interview, that commander. I interviewed a guy named Admiral uh, Igor Voronchenko, who's the, who's the, um, the Inspector General of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, and I also interviewed um, a high-ranking official in the SBU, uh, the State Security Agency, who wanted to remain anonymous. All of those four guys told me that there were highly qualified, highly experienced 
um, specialists retired from the United States, from Great Britain, who were currently in combat in uh, Ukraine with Ukrainian units. Um, so that really raised an eyebrow for me uh, because the question immediately arises, like where, there's kind of a gray zone uh, between retired and active there, especially because, you know, JSOC, Delta Force, whatever unit these guys um, are veterans of, it's not really the kind of thing you ever retire from. Um, so, you know, I think it raises some concerns about what might happen if one of those guys gets killed or captured. You run the risk um, of a pretty serious misunderstanding with, with Russia. Uh, and I also kind of wonder to what extent people like that are reporting back to commanders in the United States to the U.S. military command. There, it's, it's all kind of like this spectrum of U.S. involvement in Ukraine that really goes right up to the line of actually having our own United States military like in combat with Russia. We have pretty much all the bases covered of everything we could possibly be doing other than having, you know, a mechanized infantry uh, battalion actually there fighting. When you say retired, I immediately think of the CIA because, you know, and you would know better than me, but I just, I know that, for example, in the dirty war in Syria, when the US needed people to help run guns from Libya to Syria, they used retired officers. The CIA used, used retired officers. So I'm wondering if that's what's going on here, that that's who these people are working for, if indeed they are on the ground fighting with the Ukrainians. Um, I think there's little doubt that that's probably what's happening. Um, you know, no doubt it's an exciting time to be in the CIA. Now all the people that are on the Russia or Eastern Europe specialists. Now they have the opportunity to um, participate in killing tons of people, uh, just like you know all those who have been on the Southwest Asia uh, and Middle East and North Africa um, desks have been doing for the past 20 years. Uh, no doubt they're going all out in, in, in Ukraine. I think that that's uh, I think that that's a safe presumption to make. It was reported that there was a CIA program to train snipers in the Donbass. Uh, right up until the invasion, there were J there was a JSOC unit outside of Kiev. There were, um, if I'm not mistaken, several hundred Green Berets and uh, Florida National Guard troops at the Yavori base. Um, so all these troops were there uh, right up until the invasion began. And I think that maybe they pulled, or I assume that it's, it's true what they said, they pulled out um, active duty troops or people that were uniform personnel, but, um, you know, there, there could have well been some stay behinds and there could have well been people that have been sent over since then. That's the nature of the CIA that they do covert actions, which means that they can legally lie about it. Um, they can, you know, people who are spokesmen for the Pentagon, spokesmen for the, spokespeople for the president can stand in front of the microphone and say that, yeah, there's nobody there when in fact there are, and that's perfectly legal. When it comes to war profiteering, which we discussed earlier, I don't know if you saw this, but a few days ago, there was an interview on CBS's Face the Nation where the head of Lockheed Martin came on to do just an extensive infomercial for his company and their weapons and what a great time it was and how Congress should pass even more bills to give them even more money for, for Ukraine. But I'm wondering, in terms of military contractors who are actually on the ground in Ukraine, whether you've seen any of that. We know in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a huge business of private mercenaries, private firms profiting mm -hmm. off of the war on the ground. When you were there, did you see any of that? For sure, yeah. I mean, the country is flooded with people who want to sell drones to Ukrainians or want to offer like protection services for $2,000 a day to, to, to oligarchs or what have you. Um, as I said before, that you know, the border is wide open, so people are able to come over and try to try to um, gin up some business with, with the Ukrainians. I mean, that's, yeah, that's absolutely happening. And, you know, any experiences about that that you can relate to us that illustrate what's going on? Uh, you know, I mean, I met some drone salesmen in the, in the train station at one point. Uh, I don't know if there's too much more to that story than that. Um, I don't know how much luck they're having actually selling stuff to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are, are getting money from the United States directly um, and getting weapons from the United States directly. I'm not sure that these people are completely needed, the sort of freelance profiteers. Um, yeah, I saw in that, in that uh, funding bill that uh, just passed yesterday, 
that the State Department is actually funding the Ukrainian government directly, like the Zelensky government, the Zelensky administration, their budget comes straight from the United States. So it is a, it is a full out client state and a full out proxy war with all of that entails. And you went to a news conference that Zelensky gave. What uh, have you picked up about him and the way his government is being run and who he is listening to, who his key allies are? It's really hard to say. Um, I think uh, there's widespread agreement that Zelensky is more or less a figurehead, but what particular interests he represent is very difficult to, to ascertain. Um, it's very hard to say. I think that the there is a lot of unity in, in Ukrainian society right now where people have, there is a sense that people are coming together and putting aside the political differences that have uh, seen the country fractured uh, for years. Um, but, you know, it's certainly not in that press conference, there was no light shed on that question. I mean, all of the US journalists and all of the British journalists, you know, they ask, they all ask exactly the same question, which is, are you getting the weapons that you want? Uh, are you happy with the equipment that you're getting from the United States? Uh, can you, can you, uh, can you spell out for us, you know, all the horrors that we would see if the US and Britain stopped for one second to flood Ukraine with weapons. I mean, those are the questions that you would see um, asked just one after another from, from reporters from, from the United States and Britain. And then on the other hand, there was a reporter from, from China who was there who was asking the opposite question, saying like, you know, trying to get Zelensky to admit uh, that his constant appeal for weapons from the United States was not helpful. Um, so you saw that played out, but Zelensky is an absolute media pro. I mean, he's able to field these questions and just go off I and mean, he's very talented. Uh, performer. I mean, that's what he did before he was president of Ukraine. And it seems like the perfect guy for the moment uh, when what is needed for them is to project um, this semblance of unity and the semblance of being under attack in order to get funding from the, and pressure the United States and pressure Europe to sanction Russia and to, and to continue to provide Ukraine with all the money they needed. But it is worrisome to some extent, the fact that we really don't understand what type of government this is like we i don't have a good sense of that i mean it's complete like what kind of government is it that we're funding here um do you have a sense of uh, of what's going on what do you think or what do you suspect um that we're we're subsidizing over here and what's going to come of it well i know that Zelensky's key financial backer is an oligarch who also funds the azov battalion so I have to question his motives. And I, I do know that Zelensky ran and won on a peace mandate where he promised to take political risks to actually end the war in the Donbass, mm -hmm. to make peace with yeah. Russian speaking Ukrainians in the East. And he spoke about respecting their rights. And there's video clips of him well before he was president speaking along those lines too. But whatever his own personal intentions were, I know that essentially that he could not stand up to the power of the far right who held rallies against him every time he tried to jet and move towards implementing the Minsk Accords and ending the Donbass war. I know that he faced threats, and I've written about this, from very powerful far-right figures from groups like Azov and Right Sector, threatening even to kill him if he made peace. And yeah. the key point that the late scholar Stephen F. Cohen made to me when, when I interviewed him in 2019 about this, he said that unless the U.S. has Zelensky's back, then he has no chance to end the war in the Donbass. Mm -hmm. And what happened, what the U.S. did is just continue to side with the far right and, and abandon Zelensky's peace mandate. So whatever Zelensky's own intentions were, I have no idea. But I do know that what Ukrainians wanted him to do was end the war in the Donbass. And by refusing to back that up, the U.S. effectively sided with Ukrainian fascists who wanted no part mm -hmm. in peace and wanted, I think, the war that they're getting now. Yeah, yeah, you raise interesting points. You know, Ukraine is a really big country with a lot of problems and a ton of corruption uh, and a lot of political divisions. And, you know, the, with the war overlaid on top of it. And it's unfortunate for all the people that have to live there that they are uh, in this tug of war, proxy war between the United States and Russia with both sides pushing for armed conflict in Ukraine. And I think the most, you know, even though I'm really not able to shed light on it, like what's the exact political composition of the Zelensky administration, 
or what exactly um, has been the effect of U.S. weapons that have gone over there. I think the major um, thing that gives me concern uh, is that is the complete absence of any kind of interest in the diplomatic solution from the U.S. backers uh, of, of Zelensky's administration, because even Zelensky and people in Ukraine themselves, uh, I think that's what they would like to see more than anything else is some kind of negotiated settlement to the war so that it can, so people can stop dying, so that the shooting and bombing can stop. Um, and the complete lack of any interest in that on the U.S. side, I think is the, is the, is the main, would be my main point of criticism about what the United States is doing in Ukraine. So last question, where do you see this war going and any other final comments that you want to leave us with? Yeah, as I mentioned before, you know, my big question is whether the Ukrainians will actually try to mount a counteroffensive to retake uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, um, whether they'll try to do a counteroffensive in places like Mariupol, or whether those places are just going to be lost, uh, like the Crimea was lost, um, and whether Ukraine will just be a country like Syria or a country like Somalia or Libya, where it's... Um, not exactly a failed state, but a, a frozen conflict um, with some zones that are outside of control and a beleaguered central government uh, and militias doing pretty much their own thing and their various strongholds. Unfortunately, that is probably you know, the future that we're going to see in Ukraine. Seth Harp, journalist, Iraq war veteran, contributing editor at Rolling Stone. His forthcoming piece on international fighters in Ukraine will be out soon in Harper's Magazine. Seth, thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Really appreciate it.